Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so very much for being here at the closing out of Solutions House that apparently was only three days. And I swear I've been in this building for at least three months. It's like, I haven't seen the outside sky. I don't know what else has been going on. But Solutions House, as you know, has been co-convened by Futera, by the Exponential Roadmap Initiative, and by Google. And we're so incredibly grateful to have been working with what, such wonderful partners. We have a little gift for you this evening, well, actually quite a tall gift for you this evening, <laughs> which is um, uh, who I consider to be the world's uh, leading climate scientist, um, which is Johan Wokström. And just before we come uh, to ask, what have you heard, what have you um, seen, um, how are you feeling after having been so central to these conversations here at Climate Week, I just wanted to take a moment of thanks and recognition to everybody who has made uh, uh, Solutions Health happen, to the Exponential Roadmap Initiative team who has been here um, on the ground, to the Futera team both here in New York um, and in the UK. I want to make a special call out to MAPEM who's standing just here and to Karen who's standing just here um, and to Cara and to Sarah who are hopefully uh, watching online, to Laura who I hope is in the room um, from Exponential Roadmap Initiative. Initiative, um, and of course to all of the wonderful Solutions House Answers Only t-shirt wearers who have been helping us. Um, I'll let you into a little secret. Joanne and I decided to do this eight weeks ago, nine, <laughs> and we've managed to pull off um, an incredible um, event over that period of time. Um, and in many ways, thanks to all of you who have participated in this wonderful week of, con of content. Um, Johan, would you like to add any words before I hand to Johan? Now, just a big thanks to, to everyone. I think it's been uh, excellent, and I think we're also the idea of driving solutions. We know that we need to cut emissions incredibly fast. But we can only do that if we focus on how we scale up solutions exponentially. And I think we contributed to that narrative through <clears throat> this initiative this week. So pushing it forward. Big thanks, everyone. Thank you so very much. So, uh, Johan, the author of Planetary Boundaries, of the climate law that so many of us are working to try to fulfill, um, how has your week been? Um, what have you seen and heard over the last uh, uh, couple of days that has inspired you or interested you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Holly. And, and uh, well, great to be here. And um, it's, it's not an easy thing to do because I know that you've had a, a few very dynamic days and you're looking at solutions, you're looking at exponential roadmaps, and, and, and here we come to the final end and you give me the word and, and, I, and I unfortunately will, will, will force you to, to listen through a few minutes of, uh, of somber reality check. Um, so so I've, been, I've been dashing up and down west, east, north, south on city bikes here between events uh, basically round the clock. Like a camel out in the Sahara Desert, I've been coming to the Solutions House sometime to get some water, <laughs> but, but otherwise I've been out there in the, in, the, in the heat, in the drought, in the incremental, linear, status quo, unwillingness to really move in an exponential pattern. So I would say, I mean, that, that's the first thing to recognize, that we are in trouble and we're not making progress, and we live in a world that is not only you know, subject to increasing turbulence because of all the impacts of climate change that we're seeing, but also a world with an all-time low in terms of trust. And we need trust to collaborate as a global community to solve this global emergency. So of course, in that sense, it's, it's really important where we meet here in September 2022, but it's also to recognize that, that, that we are in deep trouble. And this, this deep trouble is, of course, accentuated even further by, by, the, by the science and by the observations we have. I mean, as you all know, the IPCC assessment is that we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius of global mean surface temperature rise. Well, if you look carefully at the data, the latest, latest assessments is that we're rather at 1.3. So we are just 0.2 degrees Celsius from 1.5. But even if you read the summary for policymakers in the IPCC, 
The conclusion today is that the short-lived climate forces, the cooling aerosols, cool the planet within the order of 0 0.3. And you know what these short-lived climate forces, what are they? Well, they are air pollutants. They are the smog that uh, shorten the life of 8 million people per year in the cities and unsustainable burning of biomass across the world. So this is the massive paradox, that the only reason why we haven't crashed through 1.5 already is, is inequity in the world, because the poor people don't emit like rich people. And secondly, that we have so polluted cities that they actually cool planet Earth to the point that we are bluffing ourselves to believe that we're still far away from 1.5. And still the IPCC gives us a global carbon budget of roughly 400 billion tons of carbon dioxide, which enables us to follow the carbon law. But you know, the carbon law is also becoming more and more squeezed, as, as you one often reminds, because you know, we're in 2022 and we burn 40 gigatons per year, so we already consumed one fourth of that budget. We have roughly 300 left. But take the cooling gases, and there is research now showing that we are very close to having consumed the entire budget. So what do we do? Well, there's only one way in my mind, and that is what Solutions House have been focusing on, which is exponential roadmaps. It is about recognizing that we have to go from linear to nonlinear change. And that is what is remarkable with this week, actually. You enter the UN space, you enter any official space, and you enter an incremental linear atmosphere. As soon as you go out of that space, you enter the nonlinear transformative space. And you go down to the Javits Center, where we've had a phenomenal three-day Global Futures Conference, where, can you imagine, we've had 200 participants, I mean, from heavy finance, the head of sustainability of Citibank, uh, Sylvia Earle, uh, Carlos Nobres, you know, a very, very wide um, indigenous community representatives from around the world designing what we call the 10 must-haves. So what is this? Well, this is, on the one hand, very, you know, it's the first time, and it's quite, uh, quite a dark entry point because the story goes as follows. We are, scientifically we know this, you know this, coming too close to, to you know, unmanageable climate risks. But not only climate, too close to unmanageable nature risks. Now, what happens if the world one day, perhaps even very soon, wakes up and realizes, oh shit, this has is, this is gone too far. This incremental linear approach did not work, which we know it hasn't so far. Then you have to have a plan B. And what is that plan B? And all resilience research shows that the way to take yourself out of a crisis, I mean, or let's put it this way, if you are in a crisis, if you are successful in transforming out of that crisis, it's only if you have a plan. You have some experience. You've experienced before. You have social agency to, to lift yourself out of that crisis. If you don't have a solution, you collapse. So a crisis can only be used in, in favor of a positive transformation if you have some idea of what you are going to invest in. So the 10 must-haves is the first attempt to develop the plan B. What are the big line items of, of decisions and investments and activities outside of the conventional agenda? Uh, basically, what's happening at the UN building now? Basically, what are the Plan B ideas that are, for example, the exponential driving forces, a global price on carbon, a complete uh, close down on all subsidies, the four trillion uh, US dollars per year in trust subsidies for fossil fuel energies. I mean, what are the dramatic decisions that we may have to take? So this is going on this week. Isn't that quite, quite a paradox? You have kind of almost like two worlds right now. And in the middle of these two worlds, you have Extinction Rebellion and, uh, and, and the youth movement standing there as, as a kind of almost like a fence in between the two. So, so in my mind, um, we are to close this, I, I feel personally very divided right now. Divided between, on the one hand, a deep, deep concern that we're moving rapidly in the wrong direction. On the other hand, um, you know, seeing that the light is still there in the tunnel and we have scalable solutions, but we have to think in an unconventional way. I think we have to do things much more intensively and, and be brave 
And, um, and no idea is a stupid idea. In fact, right now we have to you know, find coalitions of the willing, push hard, and, and, and not hesitate on, on any account. Why? Well, because by 2030, in eight years time, less than eight years time, if we, had not, if we have not cut global emissions by half, we lose 1.5. Mm. And if we lose 1.5 once and for all, then we have a very high certainty today that we will be pushing four of the 15 big tipping point systems across the threshold. Mm. And as you may have read, we published this in Science just before the mm. Climate Week. We're talking about the Green Ice Sheet, the West Antarctic Ice Sheet, the tropical coral reef systems and, and, and uh, abrupt thawing of permafrost up in the Nordic or in the Arctic region. You know, just the Green Ice Sheet and the West Antarctic Ice Sheet together hold 10 meter sea level rise. It wouldn't crash and, and raise the sea levels overnight, as we all know, but it would mean that it's irreversible. Mm -hmm. We would press the on button on irreversible commitment to all future generations to 10 meter sea level rise at 1.5. So of course we have to keep away from 1.5. So this is this is where the where we talk about a lot about storytelling. What is the story? And of course my story has a lot of darkness in it, but we need the the hope component as well. I totally agree on that. But but I think we should not stay away from the diagnostic. Yeah. Because if you want to have a cure, you better get the right diagnostics. And the diagnostics is unfortunately quite challenging to yeah. say the least. But you guys here at the Solutions House, you have the solutions. So um, get, get, get out and get it done. I think that, that's basically my final, final message here. Thank you so very much. Well, actually, if you, if you don't mind, I'm, um, particularly as we know that there's been thousands and actually uh, 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 coming up to hundreds of thousands of people who have been watching the programming here at Solutions House. And um, I 100% agree with you. At Solutions House, it's not sort of utopic or wishful thinking. Um, uh, the word solution implies a problem mm. and that the solution is absolutely focused on that. But for all those people who have been watching, watching all of this wonderful, wonderful programming this week, um, hopefully we're reaching perhaps audiences and perhaps people for whom some of this is the first time they've heard these messages. Um, for anyone who's new to this, who is overwhelmed, who is coming across these tipping points and these messages for the first time, how can they help? Well, how can people get on board and actually make the, 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 the carbon law a reality? What is your ask? Like, this is a big question for the end of Climate Week. Johan Rockström, what's your ask of humanity? Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, the answer is very simple. You, you can't believe it, but I have a very simple answer, and that is just talk to each other. Talk to each other. Share your concerns. Share the science. Talk to your neighbors. Talk to your friends. Type try to make this, uh, give the momentum it, it deserves. Because I think the biggest problem is, and, and we know this, Tony Lizarovis was with us at this Global Futures Conference, who leads at Yale University the biggest opinion polls on, on citizens' uh, views on climate change. And, and you know the statistics, 60 to 70% of citizens across the entire world are concerned about climate change, they trust the science and they want climate action. I mean, isn't that fantastic? Yeah. I mean, we just have the basis. But, but we're not kind of mobilizing that. So I think it's a question of just, just keeping the, the, the momentum and the dialogue. Beautiful. I have to say, it might have been, because this has been quite a long week, but I actually find that extremely moving as a message, which I know isn't always the purpose of science, but I actually find that a very emotional um, uh, piece around if people can talk to each other, there's a human truth there. So thank you so, so very much to Johan Roxton for closing out what has been an extraordinary week. I can't think of a better way to end our week. And thank you so very much to everyone who's been joining us here and been joining us online. Thank you. Thank you.